photograph, a calabash, a paper lay, are my Hawaiian souvenirs. Last summer, I was preparing a lecture on the history of Danish design to give four designers at a Danish company via Zoom. And it seemed like a funny proposition because I'm an American, what could I tell them about their own culture and its history? I decided to talk about this connection point at the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia in 1876. The Shakers had a booth where they were selling their furniture, the Danish government had a booth where they were showing their design, and there was cross-pollination. Some of that Shaker furniture may have gone back to Denmark, which had Shaker furniture very early on and studied it in a way that America really didn't until much later. The problem was in lockdown, sitting on my back porch with no access to an archive or a library or the book that I knew this information could be found in, I could really only prove adjacency by showing them an image that showed Shaker stuff and the exhibition and said, yeah, this happened. So I went to the official gazette, the catalog of the exhibition, which is available online, to find the images I wanted. And that's where everything fell apart, because while leafing through it, as always happens, I found other things to look at. So I got to an image of one of my favorite objects, Tiffany's Bryant vase, made the same year on view at the Centennial Exhibition. And there was a whole section of the catalog describing the Tiffany booth and all the Tiffany things there. So I had to stop and read it. I can't really explain or justify why I love the Bryant vase, but it's intensely handmade, and yet it doesn't really have a handmade aesthetic, and that intrigues me. It was made at a time when technology was starting to sort of take over from hand craftsmanship, but really the reason I love it is that it lives at the Met in New York, and if you continue on past it into the study center, you can see large copper forms that match. And it's not explained very clearly. They're just sort of there on a shelf. They were made in order to produce copies of the Bryant vase through electroplating, using what was at the time future technology, high tech, electricity, to create replicas of the Bryant vase. And for me, seeing the original and then seeing these molds is really exciting. And also, when people say 3D printing is new, I think, is it? At any rate, I had to read the entry on Tiffany. And here's what the language in the catalog said. The cost of this vase was $5,000. In addition to this, there were some extremely rich and valuable precious stones and jewelry. Those which attracted the most notice were the magnificent diamond necklace, which was the cynosure of so many eager and wondering eyes, and the aigrette, or peacock's feather, which contained the celebrated Brunswick straw-colored diamond and over 600 fine white diamonds of smaller size. Valued at $15,000, that's about $400,000 today. So I found myself looking at the image of this thing and thinking, well, what happened to it? Where did it go? And that derailed my Danish history talk even farther. A couple of disclaimers. I'm not a jewelry historian. Many people in the audience for this lecture know much more than I do. But this is really only part jewelry history. I want to present to you a research project I did based on the question I asked, what happened to this diamond feather? What was it? So this is mostly a research project. It also was my COVID-19 coping strategy, locked in my house with not enough to do. But mostly it turned out to be a celebration of curiosity. I asked one question, what happened to this thing? And then I tried to see how far I could get answering that question. And while I stalled waiting for more information or a book to come from Amazon or someone to answer an email, I just kept poking at how broad the question could become as well. And every time I hit a wall where I couldn't find the answer I wanted, I had to redirect and ask a different question or find a back door into that question from somewhere else. So this whole thing was completed in lockdown with no libraries, with no archives, with almost no emails answered. And instead of finding the answer, I ended up testing how far I could get and how many answers I could find from my one little chair on the back porch in my summer isolation. I only just this week got my hands on the amazing book Bejeweled by Tiffany, which has a lot of information that would have been very useful to me. I had many failed attempts to get my hands on it during lockdown. So I've been intrigued 
looking at the written record to see if it matches my discovered record. What I want to offer is an overview of this project. I hacked out huge parts of the narrative. I've also left out all sorts of really interesting and I think amusing and weird side paths. Every time I redirected, I found some surprise, some freakish piece of history. Even without all those layers and all the extraneous detail, I think it's a pretty compelling story. So I want to represent the larger research project and maybe inspire you to go find it, but in doing so, just give you the sort of broad strokes of this story. When I started, I had no idea that the bejeweled feather was even a thing. I thought this one picture of this one feather was a unique thing that I needed to learn more about, and the first thing I learned was it was hardly unique. It was Tiffany's 1876 version of something that had been around for a long time and stayed around. And it makes perfect sense. If you have some ginormous stone that you want to feature, it would make a great center for a feather, especially in the late 19th century craze for peacock feathers. It's the perfect center for a peacock feather. Sometimes jeweled feathers are built rigid. It's just a brooch or a hair ornament. But sometimes they're made entreblant, which means that each feather is mounted on a cylinder and inside the cylinder is a spring. So they jiggle independently. And when someone wore it on their lapel, but especially in their hair, every movement would set the feather moving around and all of those diamonds would reflect candlelight at a dinner party. The bejeweled feather stayed a thing for a long time. Here's an example in the Metz collection from the late 19th century and one from the Art Deco period in the 20th century and then one from the gift shop, which is a little unfair to include because it's just enamel and gold plate, but it shows you that there is still a presence of the glittering feather in the manufacturing of jewelry. The Tiffany diamond feather was created specifically for the 1876 Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia. And this was an event that was intentionally engineered to make a big statement that America had really developed as a nation, as a producer of technology, and with Tiffany's display especially, as a producer of world craft art and design, world class jewelry especially using historically important European gemstones. We're not hick farmers anymore, we are jewelers. The feather featured this 30 carat straw colored yellow diamond in the center. And then around that was one row of smaller diamonds set in light gold. And around that was a second row of smaller diamonds set in a darker red colored gold. And then the remaining 600 diamonds were set in platinum. So it had this gradient effect from the stone out, or you could say from the outside in, focusing your attention on that stone. And it was set on treblant, so all the individual strands of the feather jiggled around. Harper's Weekly produced a feature about the Tiffany jewelry on view at the exhibition. And this is a photograph of some of the jewelry that they took to use for the engravings that were reproduced in the magazine. Here's what Harper said about the necklace that was in this feature. It is formed of 27 rare Galconda diamonds of matchless beauty and purity, and the mere mention of its money value, $80,000, tells us at once that it far surpasses in costliness any jewel ever worn in America. That's about $2 million today, so certainly that's an expensive necklace. But I think it says more about the jewelry worn in America at the time than it does about Tiffany's ability to manufacture a necklace. A $2 million necklace today would not be the most expensive jewelry worn in America, but at the time we were not yet accustomed to expressing our wealth through our jewelry. And this is really the story of how that changed. The Harper's article continued, the diamond necklace probably attracted more observation than any other object at the Centennial, if we accept perhaps the great Corliss engine. And I loved reading that because I was doing my research on my back porch facing south four blocks from the Corliss factory where that engine was made. It's a double chambered steam engine made in Providence, Rhode Island that powered the entire fair. And it really was the, the beating heart of the exhibition, but also a real tourist attraction. It was the, the largest power plant we had produced at that point. And here's Harper saying, that's nice, but this diamond necklace is just as good. Leland and Jane Stamford visited the Centennial Exhibition and they saw the Tiffany diamond feather there, but at this point they didn't buy it. They did purchase a necklace that was described as a riviere of 27 Golconda diamonds with crescent pendant for $80,000.
It's a similar description, right? It's exactly the same necklace with the addition of this crescent pendant. So I believe it's the same necklace featured in Harper's, but augmented with that pendant. I don't think there could have been two necklaces billed as completely unique and showing the manufacturing prowess of Tiffany and the jewelry appreciation and wealth of America and have them be twins. So I think the pendant was just added. What I don't know is, was that pendant added for Jane Stanford to customize it for her? Was it removable? Could it be worn as a brooch? Lots of questions there. Let's look more at the straw-colored diamond in the center of this feather. It has a name. It's a named jewel. It's the Brunswick Diamond. So we have to know more about this name. It's called the Brunswick Diamond because it was owned by the ridiculous and wonderful Duke Charles Frederick of Brunswick Wolfenbüttel. He was the son of a fabulously wealthy royal family. And when forced from the throne through scandal, he moved to England. He fled to England, lived there for a while. Scandal sent him on to France. Scandal sent him on to Geneva. So he relocated every time the, the heat got a little too hot for him. His paternal grandmother was Princess Augusta of Great Britain, which is one reason he could flee to England as his first refuge. And weirdly, which I want to include not because it matters, but because it's evidence of the weirdness of all of the sort of um, redirects that I had and what came to the surface and what I ended up folding into the story, Boris Johnson is somehow Princess Augusta's great, 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 great grandson. There might be another great in there, I'm not sure. It doesn't matter. And so he is a relative somehow of the Duke. The Duke was many things. He was an amateur balloonist. On the left is a painting which looks like it's celebrating the ocean and a ship. In fact, it's celebrating the tiny little hot air balloon in the background and an 1836 flight that the Duke took. The image on the right is from a famous series of tobacco cards from 1910 that Willis Tobacco put out, showing the great moments of the development of lighter than air travel. And this was the Duke's 1841 trip, a five hour trip from Hastings to Neufchatel, about 10 miles from England to France. In addition to hot air ballooning, the Duke was an avid amateur chess player. He challenged the American professional chess player, Paul Morphy, to a duel. Is that what it's called when you play chess? A match in 1858. And this is a famous game for two reasons. It's called the opera match. And it's called the opera match because it was played during the intervals of a performance of the Barber of Seville at the Paris Opera House. Morphy won, even while playing with the handicap of being blindfolded. The other reason the game is famous is that it's still taught in chess strategy. It's considered an elegant and useful example of the importance of positioning your pieces early and then intentionally sacrificing pieces for later gain. So strategy. I don't speak chess, but strategizing. The Duke's scandalous life led to a lot of slanderous notices in the newspapers of his day. And the Duke of Brunswick pretty much sued anyone who printed anything about him. In 1849, a case called the Duke of Brunswick v. Harmer decided something that has relevance in today's world. He went into a newspaper office and said, do you have this particular newspaper from 17 years ago? in your archive, and they said, we do, here it is. And then he sued them because that original newspaper had a slanderous notice and he had won a libel action against them 17 years earlier. So he just went fishing for a reason to sue them again for redistributing that slander. So the Duke of Brunswick v. Harmer case ruled that even distributing one copy of a newspaper that had something that had been ruled slanderous was re-slandering someone, rubbing salt in the wound. That lawsuit disappeared into the rear view of history. But in 2009, another case, Heglin v. Google, brought the Duke's lawsuit into the courtroom again. Because Google had started posting historical libel suits on the internet, essentially reopening all of these old wounds. And that lawsuit led to Britain's Defamation Act of 2013. None of this really matters. I just think it's interesting that the Duke was lawsuit crazy and in court all the time. And one of his big triumphs is still referenced in our world today. His biggest lawsuit involved his illegitimate but acknowledged daughter. He was not married. He had a morganic relationship, which is a story for a whole other time. What is a morganic relationship? At any rate, he had a daughter. And he cut her off completely when she converted to Catholicism. He lost that lawsuit and was ordered to support her and her children. Instead, he shut up his palace in Paris and fled to Geneva and reestablished himself there. 
The Duke was famous for many eccentricities. He used enormous amounts of face paint. He dyed his beard every day. He also had a series of wigs that were sequentially longer so he could change wigs and mimic the growth of hair between trips to the barber. But most of all, the Duke was known for his diamonds. He had a huge collection of diamonds. And his house in Paris was more a diamond protecting fortress than it was a palace. It was complete with a bedroom encased in iron walls, sheet iron on all the walls. There was a secret armored safe behind his bed. There were alarms galore and guns that automatically triggered at the windows. I want to talk about some of his diamonds to give you a sense of his collection. You already know this diamond, the Hope Diamond, which now lives at the National Museum of Natural History in Washington. But it has a really interesting story that you might not know, which connects it to the Duke. He owned a much smaller seven carat blue diamond. In 1666, a huge, rare blue 115 carat diamond was sold by the jeweler Jean-Baptiste Tavernier to Louis XIV of France. The king had it recut by Jean Pital. So the 115 carat Tavernier blue diamond became this 69 carat honker. I don't know if that's an appropriate word for a diamond, but I think it describes it well. And it was renamed the French Blue. It had a seven-rayed sun on the bottom to represent the Sun King. 46 carats were removed at this time, and they had to go somewhere. It's entirely possible that the famous seven-carat Brunswick Blue Diamond was part of the original 115-carat rough diamond in 1673. It's probable, but we'll never know, because it's missing. And it turns out, in the history of storied jewels, missing is a word that enters the conversation really frequently. The French blue is also technically missing. The image on the left is a digital recreation of it that the Smithsonian produced so we could appreciate it. A lot of crazy stuff happened during the French Revolution, and while people were a little bit distracted, some things went missing, including the French blue diamond. It was never found. But the Hope Diamond appeared out of nowhere in 1812. And it's pretty much accepted now through scholarship, research, and the resurfacing of some molds and drawings that the 45 carat Hope Diamond is what's left over of the 69 carat French Blue Diamond, which was once the 115 carat Tavernier Blue Diamond. With few other recorded Blue Diamonds from this period, it's pretty likely that the Duke's Diamond was part of this story also. A lot of what I found in researching this also was the continual recutting of diamonds. And that tells you a lot about our interest in what a diamond is and does. And the shift from its commodity as a piece of remarkable nature to something that maximizes the refraction of light to create a dazzling effect. The Duke of Brunswick was called the Diamond Duke. One newspaper of his day called him the most profound adamantologist in the world. He owned 15 of the 90 then known diamonds over 36 carats. And remember, this was before diamond mining as we know it. There were many, many fewer large diamonds. Most of them were known and named and collected, and he owned a huge percentage of them. Around 1860, the Duke published a 270-page catalog of all the gemstones he owned, which is available online. I read the whole thing. I can't recommend it. The reason I read it was I tried to total up the entire carat content of his collection, and I had to give up at a certain point. It just wasn't worth the effort. But I also wanted to find those 15 biggest, more than 36 carat stones, and, and see where they came from and where they went. One of the other famous diamonds that he owned was a 15th century diamond called the Agra Diamond. It was a 42 carat pink Ronde de Longue, an oval shaped diamond, when the Duke bought it in 1844. And he paid almost 350 francs for it, which is $4 million today. The Agra Diamond surfaced in the 15th century, and its origin story is fascinating. Part of that story is not its origin, but how it got to England from India, because this important stone would not have been allowed out of the country. The story is that it was smuggled to England by some soldiers in a horse's enterolith, which is a gastrointestinal formation, a huge gallstone. The soldiers hollowed that out, put the Agra diamond in, and reinserted it in the horse's stomach, force-fed it to a horse. This certainly happened. The story is true. 
but it probably was not actually the Agra diamond it happened to, because the Duke already owned it before the story was circulated. Gem traders at the time, maybe still today, I don't know, really liked to have some romantic narrative history to attach to a stone, and that is the romantic narrative history of the Agra diamond. When the Duke owned it, it was 42 carats. It has been recut repeatedly since, and it's now 28 carats, and it's part of the Althani collection and on view at the Met, so you can go see it. The Duke died in 1873 and left his entire estate to the city of Geneva to prevent his daughter from inheriting it. So whatever your parents did to you, at least they didn't do that. His value of his estate was 24 million francs, which is over $250 million today. And all of his possessions, including his diamonds, were auctioned off by the city of Geneva. At this point, Tiffany's European dealer, Gideon French Thayer Reed, attended those auctions and purchased, among other things, the straw-colored diamond. I couldn't find good information about the origin of the diamond before the Duke owned it. I did, I think, find it in his ledger, in his publication, but I couldn't find any good information about how it arrived in his life except the name of the dealer. But this is how it got into the Tiffany stockpile. Tiffany did a lot of buying in Europe at this time for a few interesting reasons. The first was just to procure jewelry and resell it to rich Americans. It's easier than making new jewelry. Another would be to procure rare gemstones and then fashion them into new American jewelry. This is a pretty big statement, right? America can do something better with the tradition of European gemstones that it was acquiring. And Tiffany got in the habit of buying lots of European jewelry. When the French crown jewels went up for auction in 1887, Tiffany managed to purchase 24 of the 69 lots, spending almost $500,000, that's about $14 million today, to purchase over one-third of the total sale of the French crown jewels. One of the important lots was Empress Eugenie's pearls. It's easy to forget in today's world where pearls are relatively available that throughout history they were traditionally much more valuable than diamonds before we learned to cultivate them. The Stanfords bought Empress Eugenie's pearl necklace from Tiffany, expanding their growing collection of Tiffany jewelry. In 1878, Tiffany bought much of Queen Isabella II of Spain's jewelry as well, including her legendary emeralds. Some of those were refashioned into new jewelry, like the necklace on this slide. Some were sold as is. And Leland Stanford bought three sets of her jewelry from Tiffany for his wife Jane. Tiffany is really important to the story, but Tiffany is also really important to just the larger story of the development of America as a manufacturing country, as a country able to design things, and to the impression that the country started to make around the world, especially at global expositions. Stanford patronized Tiffany's brand new Union Square store at this time, and I found an article from 1878 that's a stroll through Tiffany's or a walk through Tiffany's that tells us what's on view. And it was really fun to read the article, but then to go out into the world to try and find images of the things that were discussed or pictured in that article. One of the easiest objects to find was the gilt swan centerpiece designed by Edward Moore. That's the main image of this article. And it was easy to find because in 1988, Doris Duke purchased it at auction and fell so in love with it that she traveled with it. It went with her as she cycled through all of her homes in Honolulu, in Beverly Hills, in Newport, in New York, in New Jersey. And it now lives in Newport in the middle of the dining room table. So I can go down and see it. It's lost a lot of its gilding on the outside through over affection and polishing. Other things that were mentioned or pictured in the article that were easy to find color images of because they're still around included flatware, some classics you would recognize from the sales floor of Tiffany even today. This wonderful caged Cupid brooch, which I really don't understand because he could shoot his hours of love right through the gold bars. So what's the point of caging Cupid? Also the conglomerate vase, which is not named in the article, but the description matches the conglomerate vase. It's a one of a kind thing. It was made for the 1878 Paris Expo. It's in a private collection today and it's called the conglomerate vase because it's sort of every aesthetic available mashed up into one thing but it's also almost every method of metalworking mashed up into one thing. And I think it's not a success from a design standpoint, but it's a pretty remarkable achievement. The article also reminded me that Tiffany was a reseller more than they were a manufacturer at this point. 
Tiffany really sold a lot of stuff. So Minton ceramics are described, and I went and found the exact same Minton ceramics in any number of other collections. In addition to reselling a lot of things that they just purchased from other manufacturers, they commissioned some things custom from manufacturers for just Tiffany to sell. They imported a lot of things from overseas, and then they also manufactured their own things. At this point, those things were limited to silver and jewelry. The article also rhapsodizes over the diamond feather. At this point, it was two years later, and that diamond feather was still sitting around unsold. This is when Leland Stanford saw it, not for the first time. He had seen it at the exhibition. This time, he re-encountered it at the Union Square shop and purchased it as a gift for his wife, Jane, but only sort of. So I want to stop and talk for a while about the Stanfords so you know more about them. They were from Albany, New York. They were married in 1850. She was 22 and he was 26, and I believe this is their wedding photograph. They moved to Wisconsin, where he was a lawyer. But fire destroyed his law office, and he figured after losing everything, he might as well relocate. So he moved to California to see what the gold rush could offer, and Jane joined him a little while later. He wound up as one of the founders of the Central Pacific Railroad. The Central Pacific built the western half of the transcontinental railroad, which didn't actually transcontinent. It didn't go across the continent because the Missouri River was just too broad to bridge at that point. But it went from Sacramento to Omaha, and that reduced cross-country travel from six months to just eight days. Stanford grew immensely wealthy. He bought a house in Sacramento in 1861 when he was elected governor, and he then expanded that in 1871 to become a 44-room house. Those are the two pictures on the left before and after. There was a floor added above and below. They lifted the whole house up, so it sort of became a, a house sandwich. And then in 1875, he established himself in San Francisco also in a brand new 50-room, 41,000-square-foot monster house on California Street. He also helped establish the California Street rail line, the trolley car, so that his neighborhood would, would be less remote. And then finally, in 1876, he bought and then expanded a house called Mayfield Grange on thousands of acres south of the city in an area then called El Palo Alto. All four of the founders of the rail built homes in a cluster on what we now call Knob Hill. A Nabob was a term for a provincial governor in Mughal India, but the term later got used for anybody who grew wealthy off of far off lands. Usually, a British imperialist who went to India made a fortune and came back probably with an inflated sense of self-worth. So San Francisco named this area with the four great wealthy robber barons from the railroad, Nabob Hill, because the four great Nabobs lived there, and then it got shortened to Nob Hill later. The houses are gone, but the nickname sticks. The houses are gone, but the nickname remains. At Stanford's Palo Alto farm, he had over 700 breeding and racing horses and set 19 consecutive world records by 1891. And you may already know the story of a bet on whether a galloping horse is off the ground once or twice per stride. And this farm is where that mystery was settled. Photographer Edward Moybridge, who had worked for Stanford photographing his houses, worked at the farm to develop an electro shutter and a timer to capture a horse in motion on film. After capturing a horse mid-gate with a single image, Moybridge kept working and set up a row of 12 and then later 24 cameras, each with a tripwire that opened the shutter as the horse ran past it and captured a sequence of motion with still images. This led, obviously, to the animated GIF, which I call a GIF because it's a graphical image. That's a fight for another day. The meme, the TikTok, but more immediately in his lifetime, the moving picture. Moybridge was a direct link between the still image and the moving image with his sequential images of animals in motion. And taking those still images and turning them into an animation, as I've done here, recreates the very motion that Moybridge was breaking down with still photographs. Another really important part of the story, which I'm going to reduce to two slides because I'm a brutal, uncaring person, is that after 18 years married, at the ages of 40 and 44, the Stanfords had a son. He was named Leland Stanford Jr. and born in 1868. He died just 16 years later of typhus on a family trip to Italy. He died in Florence. You can imagine that for a couple that had waited so long for a child, this was especially hard, and Jane's many telegrams home to her friends are heartbreaking to read. 
Leland and Jane decided to refocus all of their parental attention onto the children of California. They declared the children of California shall be our children. And they decided to found an educational institution in memory of their son. They gave 83,000 acres worth about $8 million and set up a $20 million endowment. And that's in $1890, not converted. The opening exercises were October 1st, 1891. And the first student admitted to Encina Hall that day was Herbert Hoover. Leland Stanford died in June of 1893 at the age of just 69. And look at this letter that Jane wrote. Her writing is florid and emotional and ridiculous and also wonderful and heartbreaking and really helps you appreciate how much her world fell apart with these two deaths. It reads, alone, all alone, my aching, bleeding heart. This signaled a period of trouble for Jane Stanford, not just emotional trouble, but practical concerns. The university had never been incorporated separately from Leland's other holdings, so its finances were all frozen until the estate was settled, which created an extreme financial crisis for her and for the university. This coincided with the larger global financial panic of 1893, and the US government immediately sued Jane Stanford when Leland died for $15 million, which was part of the estate tied up in railroad bonds that had come due. So in short, times were really tough. Over the years of their happy marriage, Leland had showered jewels on his wife. And Jane had a collection of jewelry that she rarely wore, especially since Sanford had died. And she saw this as an obvious solution to the university's cash flow problem. Amusingly, when she decided to sell her jewels and use the money to keep the university afloat, she took it all to be photographed. She wanted a record of it. And she enjoyed posing the jewelry and having its photograph taken. So she then hired landscape painter Astley Dam Cooper to make a formal portrait of her jewelry. 34 sets of jewelry were recorded in this wonderful painting, which is now on view at the Cantor Art Center at Stanford. The photographs I could not find. They seem to be missing, but the painting is there. She packed up all her jewelry and set out for London because in 1897, Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee was happening. So partly she wanted to see the Diamond Jubilee, get herself to London and see what, what was going on. But largely, she also thought that all the people coming from around the world to join the celebration, who would be going to lots of fancy related events, needing all sorts of fancy dress, would want to buy some fancy jewelry from her. So she set up shop in a hotel room uh, and she was completely wrong. She didn't realize that most people were trying to sell their jewelry to fund their lifestyle, not buy more. The economic crisis of 1893 was still really present in the world. She managed in the end to sell one Tiffany purchased pearl necklace, not the Empress Eugenie pearls, but just a pearl necklace. And that was it. She packed everything up and went home. So she solved the short-term crisis just by reducing her personal holdings. She got rid of anything she had access to. She reduced her staff to three, which is more of a staff than I'll ever have, but for her was a skeleton staff, and she really tightened her belt and used her modest monthly allowance from the estate to pay professors' salaries until the estate was settled. So there are stories of professors going to find her, and she opened up her handbag and gave them some cash for their salary. When everything was settled, she celebrated by going off traveling. She took a paid companion with her named Bertha Berner, and off she went around the world. She purchased things on all of her travels. Leland Stanford Jr., her son, had been an avid amateur archaeologist, and they indulged him by letting him buy things on all of their travels, which are now in the Cantor Art Center at Stanford. And she continued this tradition by buying things everywhere she went. So the Stanford Museum has a really wonderful collection that's very much parallel to the RISD Museum's collection from the same time, where someone with money exploring the world had access to dealers and objects that were on the market at the time being sold in a way that they really weren't for long and haven't been since. So the Stanford Cantor Art Center has artifacts from Japan, from India, from all over the world that Jane Stanford purchased and sent back. On January 14th, 1905, at her home in San Francisco, Jane Stanford drank her normal bedtime Poland water which was a revelation to me. I didn't know the brand Poland water was that old. And she detected a bitter taste and a burning sensation which made her suspicious. So she induced vomiting. She was no, no fool. The police wound up finding strychnine in the water. And of course, her tiny staff of three was immediately suspected because no one else had access. 
Fearing a second attempt on her life, Jane left San Francisco for Hawaii on February 15, 1905, and stayed at the still new Moana Hotel in Honolulu. And that hotel was new at the time, but is still there today. On February 28th, Jane had a picnic lunch across the poly from the hotel with a small group of people. And it consisted of meat and cheese sandwiches, boiled eggs, and a fresh loaf of gingerbread, all of it packed by the hotel's kitchen. That night, Jane Stanford died of strychnine poisoning. It was found in the bicarbonate, it was found in the glass she drank from, and it was found in her stomach. Honolulu's High Sheriff William Henry reported that the bottle of bicarbonate soda contained 43 grams, in which there were 662 grains of strychnine. And just FYI, one grain of strychnine is enough to kill a person. So someone really wanted Jane Stanford dead, right? In fact, they wanted 662 dead Jane Stanfords. The only reasonable suspects were the two servants who were with her. One was new since the first poisoning in San Francisco, and the other was her paid companion, Bertha. Bertha was included in the will. She inherited $10,000, which is about $300,000 today. You have to wonder if it was worth killing her boss for that inheritance. It was also unclear if the poison was placed in the bottle in Honolulu or if it had traveled with poison in it from San Francisco and just not made it out for a couple of weeks. At this point, I need to shift gears and introduce you to Dr. David Starr Jordan. He was president of Stanford and had been since its founding when Jane and Leland hired him. He was a renowned expert on fish, which is an ichthyologist, not an ichthyosaurus, that is a fish. So he was an ichthyologist. He collected fish his whole life, sometimes by fishing them with a fishing pole or a net, sometimes by asking professional fishermen to just save him anything unusual, but sometimes the more convenient method of blast fishing, which is a fancy name for dumping dynamite into the water and just blowing up everything, waiting to see what dead things float to the surface. It's an illegal method of fishing, you can imagine why. But sometimes he also did mass killing of fish by dumping strychnine into the water. David Starr Jordan was an elitist, bigoted, sexist, nepotistic bully, and a racist. I'm choosing my words carefully. He was partly responsible for producing the written work on eugenics that went on to inspire Hitler. Jordan believed in forced sterilization and championed the cause and helped make the United States the very first place in the world with legislation allowing forced sterilization. We don't think of that when we think about America and its legal footprint and its moral compass, right? We think other places are where the bad things happen. In fact, Indiana was the very first place in the world with laws saying that it makes sense to sterilize people against their will to help purify and improve humanity. Jane had founded the university with a very particular message to educate all people. Women were welcome as students and also as faculty. California's large Chinese population was also welcome. The goal was education for all, and this educational mission was increasingly out of line with Jordan's ideas about the school's future. But Jane still controlled the purse strings. It was her university. It was privately run, privately owned. She was also increasingly aware of and worried about how Jordan was running the school and all of the nepotism involved. He hired friends. There wasn't a search. The scandals along the way that Jordan was creating or allowing and then covering up to protect his cronies became more and more of a problem as Jane found out about them. In 1904, she sent a letter to the president of the Stanford board requesting that Jordan be dismissed. That, coincidentally, was just before the first poisoning attempt. As soon as Jane Stanford's death was announced, David Starr Jordan left Palo Alto for Honolulu and he took with him his own private detective to investigate what the Honolulu police already had investigated. Once there, he hired his own doctor to examine the evidence that had already been examined by three doctors, one who was a hotel guest there at the time of the poisoning and at the time of death, and the two doctors who were long-term medical professionals who performed the autopsy. The Honolulu doctors were not paid to produce their results. It was just part of their job. But Jordan's doctor was hired specifically to produce a report for Jordan. That doctor had only three years of experience in the profession. And he was paid well. He was paid $350, about $10,000 today. 
you have to wonder why Jordan threw himself so completely into this mess. Jordan produced a completely fabricated alternate reality that he spread around, and his renown made the story stick. His statement attributed Jane's death to hysteria and overexertion and gluttony, and this is how it read its amazing piece of writing. A post-mortem examination developed that the aorta had been ruptured. This was the result of fatty degeneration of the heart. So say what you will about Jane Stanford. Apparently she had fatty degeneration around that heart of hers. Dr. Ernest Waterhouse, the hired doctor, mysteriously left Honolulu shortly after this whole affair and set up shop as a rubber farmer in Malaysia. Jordan also used his influence to clear Bertha Berner, the only person present at both poisonings, and to get public sympathy on her side. So Mrs. Stanford's passing was reclassified from a death by poison to a death by natural causes, by heart disease brought on by an acute attack of indigestion, the result of consuming too much undercooked gingerbread. So I started this research at the beginning of the summer, back in June, and all through the rest of lockdown, as I think probably all of us did, one of my coping strategies was to eat a lot of baked goods, and I just had this in mind the whole time, like I better make sure my gingerbread is fully cooked, just in case this is true, that you can die from eating undercooked gingerbread. Jane Stanford's will left almost everything, her property, her belongings, her extensive stock holdings, and her remarkable jewelry collection to the university. The jewelry was worth between $75,000 and $150,000, depending on what you read or believe, or even as much as a million dollars, which some newspapers reported. She had taken the jewelry with her to Honolulu, somehow it returned back safely to California, and it could now be sold off by the university. In her will, she specified that the jewelry be sold to allow the purchase of books for the Stanford Library. The Jewel Fund, which is what that pot of money is called, continues today to fund library purchases. It exists and is reported to be worth about $20 million. This really wonderful book plate was created in 1910 to put inside any books purchased, and it has a wonderful allegory. It shows Clio, the muse of history, offering a gift of a string of pearls to Athena, the goddess of wisdom as Athena presents Clio with a statue of winged victory, the symbol of triumph. So you get this exchange, right? Jewelry is the commodity that will get you knowledge and as a result, triumph and victory. So let's return to this jewelry. There's a little bit more we have to investigate. In addition to the emeralds from Queen Isabella II of Spain, which is very hard to say, I guess she's just QI2, uh, and Empress Eugenie's pearls, there was a multicolored diamond perure, including a necklace that we need to examine. It was made for Jane by Tiffany in 1878 or 1879. Tiffany sold the diamond feather, probably for a bargain, because it had been sitting around for two full years now, to Leland Stanford, who had it immediately dismantled and refashioned as a multicolored necklace with scores of added rubies, sapphires, emeralds, pearls, and a fistful of newly mined yellow diamonds. Jane Stanford wore it one time and recorded her impressions of the experience, uh, saying how conspicuous she felt wearing it. So she put it back in its box and never wore it again. I believe that the central yellow diamond in this necklace is, slash was, the Brunswick straw-colored diamond. The feather likely didn't sell because almost overnight, the world-famous, named, storied, European, Brunswick straw-colored diamond, fell from grace. In 1866, Erasmus Stephanus Jacobs, age 15, was walking along the banks of the Orange River in Kimberley, South Africa, and he found a rock that turned out to be a 21-carat yellow diamond, appropriately named the Eureka Diamond. And then in 1869, a few years later, another kid walking along the river stumbled over an 83-carat white diamond that became the 48-carat star of Africa, the famous Dudley Diamond. South Africa's great diamond rush began. By 1870, Kimberley became the epicenter of diamond digging. By 1877, two million carats of diamonds a year were coming out of those mines. South Africa quickly produced, in just a few years, more diamonds than India had over the previous 2,000 years. So for a very long time, diamonds mostly came from India, and almost overnight, that completely shifted to South Africa. As a result, diamonds went from being exceptional, precious symbols of power 
to being a really easy way for anyone with money to show off their wealth. This is an aerial photograph from 1937 of the big hole at the Kimberley Mines. And I see this picture and it just looks like a belly button. This is the Earth's diamond producing, bejeweled belly button. It was originally 700 feet deep, which is almost deep enough to fit the Chrysler building, 1,000 feet tall. Later mining advances allowed the increased depth to go all the way up to 3,600 feet, which would fit the entire Burj Khalifa. That's under 3,000 feet. So this is an enormously deep diamond mine. The world went mad for white diamonds. That's what ended up being the big value in the Kimberley mines. But in the process of finding all the white diamonds, they found lots and lots of other colored diamonds, which became lesser diamonds. So the straw colored diamond valued for its rarity became just another diamond. A yellow diamond is just a regular diamond with elevated nitrogen content. And what happened because of the increased range of colors was the total reclassification of diamonds. The language describing colors of diamonds had to be developed. It was no longer enough to say yellow or straw colored. So the Brunswick diamond suddenly had all these new cousins and its storied history became completely irrelevant. Just didn't matter that it had a history. It was no more unique or important than the many other yellow diamonds now available. So it seems pretty reasonable to assume that it just ended up getting mingled together with a handful of newer stones to create a gaudy new necklace. That perure was auctioned off along with the entire rest of Jane's jewelry between 1906 and 1908. None of it has ever been seen again. And I was not able to find the auction records. I don't even know the exact auction date. I'm actually not even totally certain the auction happened. I have this suspicion, and I would love to find more evidence to see if I'm wrong, that one person bought it all. Somebody with an inside deal, like a trustee, said, let's not even bother auctioning it off. You say it's worth $750,000, I'll buy it. Because they knew it was worth at least twice that, if not many times more than that. And then it was put away in a box, and it's still sitting out there somewhere waiting to be discovered. That's part of the story of all these missing famous gems. They resurface later, or they don't, or they get recut. So maybe all of Jane's jewelry is still sitting around waiting to be discovered. I have a hard time believing that the jewelry could have been dismantled or dispersed without leaving some trail. The number of substantial jewels in this collection should be traceable if they're still out there somewhere. But ultimately, tragically, the real story of the Tiffany Diamond Feather is that I don't know the real story of the Tiffany Diamond Feather. It's just gone. It was dismantled and the parts are now missing. There are so many more things that I would love to share with you that are part of this wacky investigation. I did it on Instagram, so the format was Instagram structured. Square pictures, nine in each chapter. The narrative is weird because every nine slides there's a cliffhanger and I shifted directions lots of times. I was waiting for someone to get back to me with some detail, so I delayed by looking at some irrelevant related thing. In the end, it was 450 Instagram posts almost a thousand images used. It took all summer and it was a perfect diversion to keep me mentally fit and I mean as sane as I can manage to be. It was my pandemic coping strategy. It also was sort of like a gift to everyone else who I thought at that point had exhausted Netflix and needed something to look at. More than anything, it was, and apologies if any of my students are listening to this, a response to what I've seen happening over the last few years because of Google, because of the internet, because of our ability to answer the question we have, there's this developing lack of curiosity that I keep tripping over in the classroom where students want to ask the question they need the answer to and then either say here is the answer or there is no answer. When in fact the answer isn't all that important. The path you take and the things you find along the way help define the void of that question and help you answer the question yourself even if you can't find what fills the void of the question exactly. So I use this as a chance to sort of study how posing questions while seeking answers can help celebrate the meandering sprawl of the process of inquiry. Some of the things that I cut out just to give you a teaser are really exciting. Like I would love to tell you about Lola Montez, the first woman photographed with a cigarette. The crazy wonderfulness of the Order of the Golden Fleece. The wonderful ways we decided to make mounts for natural forming objects, for bezoars. 
the birthplace of the croissant and how that happened, and the history of the logo of Pret-a-Manger, which I would call the death place of the croissant, the improbable trajectory of the turn and toxic tiara, more about Charles Tiffany, who is so important to the story and so important to American design history. Also the Tiffany setting, how it works, how it wasn't really invented by Tiffany. I'd love to tell you more about the last king of the Zulu or even how to make acorn flour. The whole history of theme parks is attached to this story. Many important, famous actors and actresses have a footprint here. Also, the wonderfulness of our addiction to crystal spheres and how crystal spheres tend to come from China, whereas the bases tend to come from Japan, but many of them have wound up in America. When I finished the project, I looked back over it to see if I could sort of pull any threads to the surface. Like, what did this mean? What did I learn? If I didn't answer the question I wanted, what did I answer? And sadly, one of the things I found was so much evidence of how cruel we are to each other. Throughout history, all of our progress rests on this foundation of cruelty. And that was really heartbreaking. At the same time, all of our progress involves wonderful acts of generosity and courage and creativity and all sorts of amazing people. Some of them known, some of them unknown, some of them famous, some of them anonymous, some remembered, some forgotten. Um, some terrible and accidentally interesting, some wonderful and accidentally bad, all over the place. If you want the whole thing, it's available in order on a Tumblr page. You can read the whole thing and get all the crazy flavors. So I hope that gave you an overview of this project, but also maybe a little sort of glimpse into some of the ways I think about how to be curious and how to use the tools we have available even when they're reduced to just laptop on chair on porch without access to the resources we usually rely on, the archivists and the archives and the libraries. Thank you for letting me offer this. Thanks to Karen and to Joe and to the Jewelry Library for giving me a chance to present this information because one of the worst things about doing research is how ephemeral it is and how it just goes away. And it's really fun to get to share it.